Welcome to the Planet Media Pitch Fest. Woohoo! We are so thrilled that you all have joined here today to hear some amazing creative ideas to help kids understand climate change, its causes, consequences, and most importantly, solutions. I'm Laura Shifter. I'm a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute where I direct This Is Planet Ed. This is an initiative that focuses on mobilizing action across early childhood, K through 12, higher education, and children's media to empower young people to thrive in a changing climate. Recent surveys have shown 75% of young people have moderate to extreme worry about climate change. Many have misconceptions and many also have insufficient opportunities to learn about climate change in school. Media has the power to reach children no matter where they live, and a campaign focused on hope, humor, and solutions can really make a difference in giving kids the knowledge and skills they need to lead a sustainable world. We've had the opportunity to partner with the Nature Conservancy to basically distill down what all people should know about climate change into four simple messages. The Earth is our home, it's getting hotter because of us, it's changing now and impacting us, but together we can make the changes we need for a brighter future. Now, we have put a call out to creatives in January of this year to share with us their ideas for engaging content aimed at children ages eight to 12 to use these principles and help build children's understanding. We were absolutely blown away by the interest we received from creators. We got over 200 submissions in the course of one month. And from these submissions, with the help of our wonderful Planet Media Task Force, we selected seven finalists who will present their concepts to you all today before an amazing panel of judges that I'll get to in a moment. Um, because before I introduce the judges, I'd like to say a few quick thank yous. First, a thank you to the Kellogg Foundation, Pure Edge, the Heinz Family Foundation, and the Alice Ann and Terry Collins Foundation. Without their amazing support, this work would not be possible. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to the Planet Media Task Force, many of whom are here today, for their time and engagement and input all along the way in this process. A special thank you to Susie Jaramillo and her team at Encantos. On Wednesday, you will be able to see um, a sneak peek of a pilot video they have created using these principles called This Is Cooler. And we have special guest feature, Gloria Stefan, took part in that video as well, which we're really excited about. And also a big thank you to Amy Friedman for the time and energy she's put into um, getting the finalists ready today. So now let me introduce you to this wonderful panel of judges. First, we have our two Planet Media co-chairs, Gary Nell, who is a senior advisor for Boston Con Consulting Group and former head of National Geographic, NPR, and Sesame Workshop. We have Catherine Hayhoe, who's the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and has been amazingly helpful in getting these principles uh, solid and secure. And we have two special guest judges, uh, we have guitarist, songwriter, and record producer, Niall Rogers, American music legend, and science educator, uh, engineer, and comedian, Bill Nye. So yes, please join me in thanking these amazing judges. Now, just to let you all know a couple of things about the way that this um, pitch fest is going to run. Each finalist will have about seven and a half minutes total for pitching their concepts. That'll include their pitch and Q&A. The creatives have submitted robust concepts that they've spent a lot of time on, and we've said, okay, get that down to four minutes. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot that they are not covering in this, but hopefully you'll get a really great um, idea of what it is that they're trying to convey. And these ideas range from podcasts to anime to music videos and more. The judges will select awardees based on their creative magic, ability to hold the climate principles, the use of hope, humor, or solutions, and those awardees will receive a budget towards content creation. We will announce the awards at the plenary on Wednesday morning, so we hope to see you all there. 
And after receiving awards, um, the content creators will get support in creating their content uh, and connecting with the science over the next couple of months and will premiere their content this November. We would love for you all to get in on the fun too. So there are QR codes at your table and you can log into the QR codes and provide feedback on the um, pitches themselves as well. So without much further ado, please join me in welcoming our first finalist, Lindsay Owen, to share her concept, Solar Punks. Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh, this is so, so cool. Um, <laughs> hi, Bill Nye, like wild, right? <laughs> Um, so my name is Lindsay Owen, and I'm super, super excited to share my animated series concept, Solar Punks, with you all. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. This is me in my personal life, uh, shopping at a plastic-free bulk store, eating plant-based, composting, and then lamenting the amount of space that my compost takes up in my freezer. <laughs> and here's me in my professional life. As you can see, I've written for a lot of animated kids' shows and podcasts. Uh, my most recent project was for a company that loves to keep things confidential. So I could tell you more about it, but then I'd have to kill you. And that would really bum me out because I really like Bill Nye. Uh, <laughs> I've devoted my career to kids' animation because it's the medium that means the most to me in my personal life. To this day, I revisit childhood cartoons as if they were old friends. And I really firmly believe, uh, and this is backed by science, that humans are very, very visual learners and that animation is a super effective way to convey complex topics. So, needless to say, when Planet Media's RFP came across my desk, this... <laughs> 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 this was me! What a great way to combine my personal climate activism and my career. That brings me to my animated series concept, Solar Punks, which I started creating years ago as a way to combat the hopelessness around climate change. I am an optimist, and I strongly believe that if we create a narrative around the future of community, beauty, and action, that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And to preface, I'm a writer, I'm not a visual artist, so any of the visual aids that you see in this uh, display and in, throughout the presentation are just for inspiration, not final. Um, the title Solar Punks is a play on the solar punk genre, which imagines a world uh, where we're in perfect harmony with nature. Our heroes live in a utopian future where city and nature blend seamlessly and people rely on reuse over buying new. In the future, our four friends that you can see here run a mobile shop fixing things for their community but unprecedented problems start to emerge in their perfect world. Animals start to vanish, pollution appears out of nowhere, and these realize, they realize that these issues are caused by people in the past, our present, uh, not living sustainably. So they use their time-traveling AI van, Ada, to go back to our time to help kids start eco-friendly projects. When they return to the solar punks utopia in the future, we get to see the ripple effect that these present day actions have years later, showing that tiny actions now really can make a di big difference for the future. The solar punks world is populated by fantastical sci-fi characters that I really hope will become our audience's best friends. Our heroes are a cyborg, a plant human hybrid, a lizard human hybrid, and an artificially intelligent van. Together, they're ready to face any challenge that comes their way. If we're fortunate enough to receive funding from the Aspen Institute, we're going to create an animated short that showcases Planet Media's climate principles and encourages real-world impact. In this episode, the solar punks face a future without bees, prompting a time travel mission to 2024 to bring pollinators back. They team up with a city kid to start native plant container gardens on urban fire escapes, illustrating a practical response to the pollinator crisis. We'll complement this short with a project-based curriculum so kids can create their own container gardens, therefore enacting the short's solution in their local communities. All these resources will be hosted on a widely accessible website, ensuring that teachers, students, and community leaders can implement these activities seamlessly, turning inspiration into actionable change. And we can map this episode structure onto any area of climate science. The solar punks locate a mysterious problem in their utopian future. They travel back in time to 2024 and use real science to solve the problem. Then they go back to the future and see the results manifested. 
But storytelling is just the first step. We want these stories to serve as a springboard into activism. Solarpunk shorts will get kids excited about climate science, inspiring them to learn more through our project-based curriculum. And now, armed with the tools they need, they can go out and bring sustainability to their local communities. To achieve my vision of transforming storytelling into impact, I partnered with Global Tinker. They're a multi-award winning children's media company focused on harnessing the power of media to inspire real world learning. And they've had incredible success in a really short amount of time. Just last week, they were recognized by the National Science Foundation as having one of the most innovative science programs in the country. I really couldn't be in better hands. With the state of climate education today, it feels scary, it feels overwhelming, and it feels like a chore. And kids hate chores. Uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. Solar Punks can, is here to show kids that climate action isn't just a necessity, it's also pretty cool. So hopefully, when they think about climate action, they'll feel a little bit more like this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was yeah. such a great presentation and so fun. So I love the way that you present a possible future and then you show how kids can make a difference and affect that future. That's really the definition of efficacy, showing them that what they can do can make a difference. We all want a better future, but our picture of a better future might look different. So can you elaborate a little bit on what better future you're going to be painting and how that appeals to the 8 to 12 year old genre? What would make them feel like, yes, that's a world I want to live in? Yeah, so I really imagined a future where, like I said before, um, nature and humans live together in perfect harmony. Mm -hmm. So instead of sort of like, uh, you know, I live in Brooklyn, there's garbage all over the streets all of the time. So instead of that sort of like um, urban waste that we're kind of used to seeing, seeing something that's really sleek and modern and combined with nature, um, plants incorporated into every building um, and things like that. And I also sort of envisioned these really cool sci-fi characters to populate the world where some of them have different sort of futuristic uh, aspects to them, right? Like one of them is a plant hybrid. Uh, one of them is a lizard hybrid. We have like a talking vehicle um, who is their time travel machine, but also their best friend, right, who uh, carries them from place to place. So I really hope that um, this vision of the future will get kids as excited about climate science as I am. Okay. Thank you. This is, this is great. This is very cool. Uh, where did you, is ADA an acronym? It is. It stands for Artificially Intelligent Driving Apparatus. There you go. <laughs> and why did you go solar punk instead of, uh, what, renewable punk or something? Yeah, so solar punk is actually like a sci-fi sci subgenre. Ah, uh, yeah. And okay. it's like, you know, like something like cyberpunk kind of imagines a world where we're all these sort of like gritty, rusty cyborgs, and solar punk is much more of like, uh, bright and green and beautiful and lush. So, Clean. Yeah. So five years. Five years, yes. Um, so this is definitely something that sincerely appeals to me, right? Like I, uh, I've been ruminating on this for a long time and it's important to me that kids uh, really see my vision um, and it gets out there and it makes an impact, um, which is why I partnered with Global Tinker because they are the science behind my writing. Right, and they're also the production. Um, they've made several animated series before that have made a big impact uh, on various platforms. So I think like with our powers combined, we have both the writing, the storytelling, and the curriculum, the science to really make an impact. Excellent. Everybody, please join me in thanking Lindsay Owen. That was awesome, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Now we have our second awesome finalist. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Frazier to share his concept, What Happened to the Fireflies? Yay! Thank you so much. I'm going to give a shout out to Niles Rogers. Because <laughs> my family, that's all we heard. I got several of your records in storage right now. So thank you so much. And I need them signed, so we got to work together. Okay? <laughs> Uh, my name is Anthony Frazier, and all my professional life, I've used what I've learned from my experience in the inner city and merged that with my experience building startups in Silicon Valley. And I've noticed that important information doesn't always reach the people who needed it most, especially people that look like me. So technology became my great equalizer. 
I've been accepted into two tech accelerators. I created a major tech conference that toured the United States for diverse founders, and I became the first entrepreneur in residence for New Jersey's largest venture capital fund. But still not satisfied with the way black stories were being told, I actually decided to become a storyteller myself. With investments from Audible and Morgan Stanley, I founded ABF Creative, a Webby Award winning podcast, network, and production company where we help tens of thousands of black and brown children boost their self esteem through audio. And I also sit on the advisory board of Black Representation, Stories for Climate Prep, a National Science Foundation funded project that unites experts across multiple fields to help create more climate change media for black children. So when I got the Planet Media RFP, I knew it was the perfect opportunity to start putting some of, those, some of the action behind some of those methods we've always been talking about. Climate change is affecting the globe. It knows no color and no social status. Yet, much of the climate change media today doesn't necessarily speak to children, like African American children, especially in the inner city, where we can argue the impact is much worse. That's when I decided to create a fictional mystery podcast that answers the question that so many people where I'm from is asking, what happened to the fireflies? <laughs> and what happened to the fireflies, Kevin and Misty, a brother and sister duo, go on an adventure throughout their city to find out why the firefly population seems to be getting smaller and smaller each year. They hear about fireflies from their father who had so much fun playing with them over the summer in the neighborhood, and now Kevin and Misty are trying to find out what they can do to bring them back. They do not yet care about fireflies, uh, or climate change for that, for that matter. It just doesn't seem relevant to them. But as every episode weaves in the four climate principles, they discover it's a lot closer to home than they think. Here's how the podcast will work. The podcast will be 12 episodes. Each episode will be 10 to 15 minutes each. Every episode, our main characters will learn something new, go on a mystery, go on a journey, solve a case, and then they'll have a call to action at the end. That call to action won't just go to the Kevin and Misty, but it will also go to the listeners of the podcast. The narrative will be supported by sound cues and custom music. We'll have it written by our professional writing team, and we'll distribute the podcast on every major podcast platform, including YouTube. There's an opportunity to engage with kids with episodic mysteries, and I want to bring back that nostalgia factor that we used to hear when, or used to see when we were watching like Scooby-Doo or the Hardy Boys, um, except with a new ecological and environmental twist. And we're creating a Trojan horse that will intentionally entertain first, but educate second. As you can see, it skipped ahead a little bit, but <laughs> it's all love, because change requires innovation, and we have to be where kids are already at. And so we created a new kind of podcast called Mini Pods, and Mini Pods are a short 60-second podcast that actually plays two times a day, and it replaces the school bell. And I'm proud to announce that we're playing right now in over 120 New York City public schools as we speak. So thank you so much. So what happened to the fireflies is a perfect opportunity for us to create climate change information that reaches over 100,000 students a day. And that's a story that I can be satisfied with. In closing, I ask not just for your, your attention, but for your action. Join me in changing the world. And I got one more question. Where's the funding? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes, so um, you mentioned your company makes other pro podcasts. Yes. Can you share a little bit about uh, your other work and how you see this podcast connecting to that other work? Yeah, so we, we, we are really, I would say, really obsessed with making short form content. We know that children's attention span is very uh, short, so we, we have a lot of podcasts that just feeds to that. So we have African Folk Tales, which is a short form podcast that tells that modernizes African folk tales. We have a daily affirmations podcast called Charm Words, which reaches about 100,000 listeners a month as well. So we're all, we're all about just trying to boost self-esteem and create short form content that can just get their attention and that can be consumed very easily. So those are some of the podcasts we work on. Gary, the king. So the, um, 
I, I'm, I'm still obsessing about Scooby-Doo and the <laughs> rut row for climate change. Uh, <laughs> But um, can you expand a little more about the urban neighborhood and why you feel that's such an important component of this enterprise? Uh, well, you know, we have trees in the hood, too, you know? <laughs> but I, I think, so, you know, that's, that's, what, that's the big thing about fireflies, right? We used to see them all the time. We used to have a lot more green in the inner city, but now we're losing that. There's a lot of habitat degradation. So, you know, that's the reason why I want to focus on the inner city, because I think sometimes we forget that, like we said, there's trees here too. You know, there's, there's nature here too. And if we ignore that, then we can start seeing things happen like losing fireflies and it could be much worse over the next 10 years. Um, you explained that each episode you would have a climate yes. lesson in it. Can you give us like just two or three examples very briefly of what those lessons would be on climate? Well, habitat degradation is one. So, you know, a lot of the activities that we do in Newark, New Jersey, for instance, is rebuilding gardens or taking empty lots and creating new gardens, new ecosystems for insects and animals to thrive in. And so that's one of the lessons that we'll learn. Is, and and the, the other thing is that these, these are young kids. They don't know science, right. you know, so they, they don't know these things. They don't care about climate change yet. Uh, so they'll have a mentor in the show, you know, that kind of guides them through all of these different steps. So, Will there be multiple voices? For, yes. Yeah. There'll be multiple voices. There'll be characters like their father, um, their mentor, which is, their, you know, Kevin's science teacher. Um, they'll have their mom, you know, local store owners. It'll be different um, characters each episode for the most part. Are you going to integrate the method of science? Yes. That's How will where, we do that? That's where the experiments come into play. Shout out to you. <laughs> so there's, it's all audio, though, right? It's all audio. Radio is the most visual medium. And so uh, the experiments are all with sound. Well, well, we'll explain it. It'll be very explained. It's hard to go through this, but we've, we've done it before. Well, we'll be very detailed, and we'll make sure that they can see things online as well. We'll have a visual aid to go oh, along oh, with I it. Excellent. Please join me in Thank thanking you. Anthony Frazier. I know that that is a question that I have all the time. What happened to the fireflies? Okay, next up, we're going to have Livia Beasley, who actually will share two pitch concepts. Uh, one is a take on the cup song, and the other is for a show called Dolly and Toy Man. So thank you, Livia. Hi, everyone. Oh, my goodness. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you all so much for coming, for hosting, for bringing this passion area for many of us, giving us a platform to, um, to do what we do um, and make a difference. My name is Livia Beasley. Uh, I'm a writer, produ uh, producer, creator with a background at Sesame Workshop in Nickelodeon. Um, I'm also proud to be the founder of Children's Media Association. Uh, we've spent 20 years uh, connecting the dots of the industry uh, across generations and areas of expertise. I'm currently a development executive for the faith-based uh, Kids Network Minnow, as I'm also a Sunday school teacher. And I'm here as chief pebble skipper of my own company, Pixel and Pebble. We have a mission-minded approach and a playful voice. Our mission is to spark little kids to do big things, because little things can make big ripples, and pint-sized people can make waves. So, pardon. <laughs> so this um, initiative is in such a passion area for me that I submitted three ideas, and I'm so grateful that Planet Media is allowing me to present two, so I'm gonna have to go really quickly. The first is about a generic action figure and doll. The second is about a plastic cup and a reusable bottle. Okay, let me go back and tell you why this is so important to me. This is my mother, Victoria. She's so beautiful. She's a fine artist. She gave us a boy toy for every girl toy because she wanted us to have self-determination. In my house, Barbie and He-Man were a team. <laughs> this is my father, Val. He's a retired professor of veterinary wildlife and ecological toxicology. So our dinner conversation, since I was this big, we're about conservation. And our vacations included attending scientific meetings and then going hiking and picking up the trash. <laughs> this is Jelly and Toy Man Save the Universe. 
It's a comedic action series uh, pilot about two twin tweens who help stop polluters in their tracks, while these two, a plastic doll and an action figure, claim the credit. Jackson and Jade, not shown here, are twins who do not get along. They receive unwanted birthday presents, a doll and an action figure, and they throw them in the garbage. Then, in the middle of the night, there's this combination of mustard and hot dogs and moonlight that turns them into real superheroes. But they're still tiny and plastic and stiff. Um, they have a heart for the environment. And they have a mind filled with plastic because they're still toys. So they have terrible ideas. Here's the formula. The twins are enjoying their lives at school, at home. There is a climate change problem that we see. And soon we find an uninformed culprit. So Dolly and Toy Man get it way wrong. They want to shove an iceberg into a volcano. The kids get it right. They show the person how to make positive changes, like using renewable energy and planting trees. So we'll meet an environmental scientist or professional who teaches us about climate action and their specific career. Um, and though Dolly and Toy Man were way wrong, the kids were the real heroes. They kiss their muscles and consider it a win. So Dolly and Toy Man um, teaches about climate action and careers, and it connects with their kids' natural sense of humor and helpfulness. And it also has serious potential. OK, turn around 180 degrees. The second concept is the Conservation Cup song. It's an intergenerational music video that uses storytelling and a catchy song with motions to drive action. OK, let me refresh your memory on the phenomenon that is the cup song. Oh. Whiskey for the way, and I sure would like some sweet company, and I'm leaving tomorrow, what do you say? You may know the song already. You may already know how to clap it out. <laughs> um, OK, so we will start with the popular public domain song largely as written, lightly changing the lyrics, When I'm Gone. Uh, and then we'll tell a music video story with tweens who are experiencing climate change firsthand. It's so hot. Soccer practice is canceled. They slump down, throw their bottles in the trash, and have a wake-up call. They realize climate extremes are affecting their real lives, and they can help. So they recycle their bottle, and they grab reusable bottles, and we re write the lyrics and reimagine the song, When I'm Home. We make a difference personally and at school. We widen out. We're talking to family. We're talking to our friends, our community. We make bigger changes. It's intergenerational. It's all about taking action, spreading the word, and rippling out. To make, it, to make budget and to make it great, I plan to work with essentially my family, my real family, my almost family. Uh, my good friend Otto Gross, uh, who creates these really catchy songs using found sounds, and my hubby Corey Beasley, who's a short filmmaker, uh, to create a moving story. So it's about taking action and sharing it. It's replayable, it's memorable, and it has viral potential. This guy is my why. <laughs> this is my son Darian on his fifth birthday getting his vaccine. Kids today are going through real hardships, and they're unique to this time. So I thank you for helping us make my kiddo's future brighter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Livia. As a mother, I certainly have the same why, too. So um, with the cup song, um, and I love that you're presenting these two different ideas, but with the cup song, what actions will the song encourage kids to do? You mentioned recycling, but yes. what climate actions will it encourage them to do? Oh, gosh. I want to show as many as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I want to work with like real, real families doing real things in some parts. Um, but um, it could cover, you know, it, I do want it to cover things like that and using reusable bottles mm -hmm. and using like reducing energy. But I also want to, so they'll be tapping out the bottle this whole time, you know. And, um, but I also want to show like someone planting trees, someone ride sharing, someone putting on solar panels. Um, and I'm going to have to kind of watch the budget. So I plan on just like literally working with real people doing those things. <laughs> Thank you. So that's, you hit it, <laughs> hit the nail on the head. I was thinking about how do you 
plan on using the budget? How do you? Okay. So you're right. This is a modest budget, <laughs> given what I'm hoping to do. Um, uh, you know, fortunately for me, uh, my hubby and I have a production company. We can largely do a lot of the um, music video production ourselves. Um, you know, including the the writing and the producing and the filmmaking and the post production and all of that. So for that one, the budget will go towards the music composition. Um, and uh, depending on the, if I do get this, and, and depending on the budget I receive, I'd love to also um, ask Otto to incorporate, we have this wonderful like music community in Nashville, um, and I'd love for him to potentially like bring in a voice, a gospel voice, a country voice, a hip hop voice, um, so that we can be really, make a real connection to different audiences. Um, but, uh, and then with the animation, um, we'll put the money, we'll sort of focus the money on having a great design, having great audio underneath it, and having a, a you know, getting the sense of humor there. Um, but we have this, the photo reel backdrop. The photo reel backdrop helps us root it in the real world and really so have So it's that. both live action and uh, it's animation in front of uh, photo reel backdrop. Photo reel, yes, exactly. That's the mixed media approach I think is what's gonna make it. Um, relatively affordable. I'll also work with friends, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and find partnerships that way. Excellent. Please join me in thanking Livia. Great job, Livia. Thank you so much. And next up, we have a special visitor who's coming to us by video, Dr. Jose Moray, who will be pitching a video called Echo Musica. And we have WHRO's Ken Nishimoto and Nick Danzi here to take Q&A. So... Watch the screens now for the video. Buenos dias a todos. My name is Dr. Jose Moray. I'm originally from Caguas, Puerto Rico, and I'm CEO of Ad Astra Media. My background's a little different than most people in media. I was originally a physician, studied medicine. Then I studied artificial intelligence. I've been an executive at IBM developing Watson for healthcare initiatives, and I've been an advisor to the previous three administrations. During the Obama administration, I was an advisor to NASA iTech, developing AI applications for deep space initiatives. During the Trump administration, I led a team called Cord19, in which they produced a documentary, utilizing large language models to be able to create rapid development of both diagnostics and therapeutics for COVID-19 fight. After that, I've worked with the Biden administration, helping to direct the executive branch in both policy and regulation around generative AI on the NIST panel. I've also been an advisor to the United Nations around the World Food Program, developing AI applications to help alleviate hunger throughout the world. But oftentimes, in all the projects I've worked on, I'd be the only Latino. Sometimes, I'd be the only person from any underrepresented group. This is why I created Ad Astra Media. You see, oftentimes, Latinos and other underrepresented groups were depicted as janitorial staff or musicians or potentially athletes. But very seldom, or if ever, are we in positions of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM, or STEAM roles, which we know are the ones that are creating the greatest amount of generational wealth. So I decided to do something about it and create a media company that was focused on showing underrepresented groups and highlighting them in those fields. Because if we don't tell our stories, who will. And I apologize that I can't be there today. I will be on a stage in Washington, D.C., speaking to folks about the importance of generative AI, both from a regulatory and policy perspective. So I apologize that I can't be there. But our partners from WHRO, PBS, and Eastern Virginia are to be able to answer your questions and talk to you about the project that we're working on. This brings me to our partnership with WHRO, which is here in the audience with you and hopefully momentarily on stage. We're working on a project based on a very successful science-based theory called Green Beats. This is something that WHRO developed in partnership with the Baden Institute. It's received many awards, Emmy nominations, and been able to teach kids successfully about climate science and climate change and things that they can do to actually make a difference. The unique thing that Green Beats brings to the table is that it imbues these educational learnings with music, with vibrant colors, and with all the aspects that really inspire and aspire kids to do better and to make a difference in the world around them.
we are looking to do is take all the goals and wins that Green Beats has done and turn it into a new franchise called Echo Musica. Echo Musica will be focused on the Latino community and take the colors and the feel and the music from the Latino community and take everything that makes us Latino, our indigenous roots that connect us with the environment, that are really focused and grounded on traditional values, on values of comunidad, of familia, of that interconnectedness to nature, that we come from nature and we're here to support nature and imbue those values into the scientific learning. And then we can teach the core principles that are brought into through this initiative of how, how the world is our home and it is getting hotter. And yes, we are responsible for that, but we have the ability by taking those traditional Latino values to be able to heal our world, to take that sense of familia, of comunidad, and be able to restore a harmonious balance to this world, the only one that is our casa. Thank you very much. And our partners from WHRO will be speaking to you now and answering some questions. Ready for questions? <laughs> yeah, ready. Okay. Good. Well, the, I'm going to take the music from Nile for a second here. But um, so my wife Kim does a lot of work with children and nature, and you guys from the public broadcasting world, it's all about community outreach. So could you talk a little bit how you connect kids with nature and and what the how you kind of get a practical application of the curriculum behind uh, Echo Musica? Yeah. So. Um, what makes WHRO really unique? We're the only public media station that is actually owned by tw 21 of our uh, K through 12 school divisions. Um, so outreach to the schools is a pretty big priority for us. So with Green Beats, which Echo Musica is gonna be a part of, we actually have an environmental science van which, um, themed after Green Beats, and that's basically a science lab on wheels that tours and go, visits these schools and allows students to, to get their hands on um, and, and interact with, with these things that will teach them environmental science. And more recently, and this is my favorite part, is that we've partnered with the Virginia Stage Company and came up with a half hour musical um, based on Green Beats. Um, so now, the, and that is touring the schools as well, so now the kids are getting a big show, musical show, as well as um, getting to go in this moving science lab and, and get hands-on learning. And I have a friend who's a teacher, and she said, um, because Green Beats is on TV, they already knew all the songs when the, these, these performances came. So yeah, we have a pretty strong outreach program right now. So where would the money go? to produce the animated series or to produce music or to distribute the music? None of those. It's a whole nother, go ahead. Oh, so, so um, it would be- They're shorts, yeah. Be, they're, they're shorts, they're, they're about, they're gonna be about two, mi two minutes each. So a lot of it would be hiring songwriters. We, we have um, some great songwriters that worked with us in Green Beats who really prioritize actually giving kids good, mu good music, something that also parents can enjoy and listen to. Um, so some of the money would be to the, the actual music writing and production, um, and as well as getting more animators. Um, so far, Green Beats has really just been me, the, the two of us, but I think with more funding and with more animators, we can produce something even more smooth. We're public media, so we don't usually use a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, please join me in thanking Ken and Nick. Thank you all so much. All right, next up, we have uh, Mindy Thomas and Meredith Halpern Rasner, who will share their concept, Planet Wow. Hello, I'm Mindy Thomas, and seven years ago, my partners, Guy Roz and Meredith Halpern Ranser, all had young kids who were becoming more screen obsessed by the day. And as parents, we wanted our kids to get outside, to have conversations, to have agency in their world. 
And as media makers, we wanted to tell stories that would connect laughter to learning and kids to the amazing world around them. And our first and most beloved podcast, Wow in the World, does just that. Wow in the World is a cartoon for the ear, a science-filled show that uh, is all about new discoveries. We take real-world, peer-reviewed research and wrap it in a narrative that is as funny as it is informative, with characters and sounds and just very visual for the ear. And over the years, it's been downloaded more than 220 million times in 178 countries. It spread to the New York Times bestseller list, a live stage show, educational products, and more. And while we make it our mission to wow kids with all the amazing things happening in our world, we also invite them to share what they know might wow us. And we share these wows at the end of the episode by giving kids a platform to share their voices. So let's take a listen. My wow is that more than 270 million people visit America's national parks each year. My wow is that there's a spring in Florida that in the winter, over 700 manatees visit to stay warm. And my wow in the world is that the oceans produce the majority of the oxygen on Earth. And now, we're inviting these kids to get outside and to share where in the world they go to find wow. And it's all through Planet Wow, an epic geocaching adventure. Through this adventure, we're going to send kids on a mission to get out in the world where we find, where they will find geocaches that are hidden in places, where they go in places that they love. Because when you love something, you want to take care of it, right? So, but first, what in the wow is geocaching? Well, for anyone here who doesn't have experience with it, think of it as a, a real world, worldwide treasure hunt that uses smartphone GPS guidance to help participants find hidden containers or caches near them. And these treasure boxes could be anywhere. There are over three million around the world. And according to my GPS tracker, there might be five located somewhere in this room. Where could they be? Gary, look under your chair. Anybody find them? Look under your chairs. Did we find any geocaches? Look, there's one. Wow. What are the chances? What are the chances? All right, so here's how Planet Wow is going to work. First, we're going to find 1,500 trackable geocaches in places that exemplify humans taking care of the planet. Places like uh, bus shelters and community gardens and solar-powered libraries. Inside, there will be directions on how the finders, these families that find them, can hide the geo or rehide the geocache in a place that makes them say wow. We'll create mini podcasts about the four, the four principles of climate action and ask kids to submit videos about a place on the planet that wows them. And then we'll give them directions on how to make and hide their own planet wow geocaches. Finally, we'll top it off with a very special episode of Wow in the World dedicated to climate action and the four principles. And we'll end the episode with these kids sharing their voices about plays on the pl places on the planet that wow them. Through Planet Wow, an epic geocaching adventure, we're inviting kids and encouraging them to get outside, to, uh, to see the planet as their shared home, and to build a community of climate crusaders one wow at a time. And because this is so personal for us, I would like to end with my partner Meredith's son, Elias, sharing where in the wow, he, where in the world he found his wow just a few years ago. He's not cooperating. He doesn't cooperate in real life either. He's 15 now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Why don't we start questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you use the word wow a lot. I, I, I have a feeling that he was pretty cool. So he's, he's very off. cool. Yeah. I'll just presuppose so it's the that. Grand Canyon, a place we've done lots yeah. of. Yeah. Um, so um, can you share what the word wow means to you and why is it so interconnected to your work? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. Everything we do and everything we hope to do in the world is about 
putting out wow into the world and spreading wow. When you feel wow, the word wow is also awe and wonder. And when you feel that, you actually are feeling more connected to the world and to others, you're more conscientious, you're more curious, you're more creative. And so it is our mission at Tinkercast to put wow out into the world. And it's something that is part of everything that we do when we make content, we make podcasts and books for kids. We don't start out thinking, well, what do they need to know? What do they need to learn? We look for things that wow us first, because if we're in awe of something, then we want to share it with our listeners and our viewers and our readers. Got it. So the, this is like, uh, uh, like Pokemon to the 10th power? Like, we call it a cartoon for the ear. Okay. No, this geocaching. Oh, geocaching. Yeah. Geocaching. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But with, but in the real world, with right. real things, <laughs> touching nature. So real lunch boxes or uh, <laughs> uh, these boxes. So getting to the Grand Canyon, I'm right there on the wow. Yes. But where are the other places uh, that uh, somebody who lives in a city, where is he or she going to find such a thing? Mm -hmm. And uh, is this people are submitting videos, but it's a podcast? Back to you. Okay. Yeah, so, so first of all, we're going to hide them 1,500 in locations around the world where climate change is happening. So uh, say a so solar-powered libraries, for example. And then we encourage kids to find them, but then also rehide them in a place that matters to them, a place on Earth that they love. Then there will be an app where they could go into the app. A QR code will be listed on, in the geocache. They'll click on the app. They'll make their video submit it, and then people can watch these all as these trackable geocaches spread around the world, see where they go. Yeah, we're going to have a map on the microsite where you're going to see these wow being spread literally around the world. Yeah. They'll be high, they'll be restashing what they call trackables. For those of you who do know geocaching, it's very complicated. We didn't want to get too into it here. Um, and then as far as the video goes, well, yes, we will have the videos up, but we'll also take the audio and put it at the end of our episode. We're going to make a special episode of Wow in the World about this. Excellent. Well, wow. Thank you all so much. Please join me in thanking Meredith and Mindy. Thank you. And next up, we have uh, Young and Nock here to present their concept, Yo Zeno. Yo. <laughs> Test, test. Uh -huh. Hey microphone. everyone, I'm Young Park, and it's, it's such an honor for us to be here. Uh, for many years, I used to work in finance, but I wasn't really happy since I wanted two things for myself, which is make an impact and love what I do. So I jumped into the world and business of kids' media. And over the years, I worked on so many great shows, but having my first kid really inspired me to focus my efforts and energy on projects that have more impact and value beyond the screen. So I'm here today with my good friend and partner, Nock. Hello, everyone. My name is Nock, like knock on the door, and I work <laughs> as a director in animation. My experiences include directing for Disney, Netflix, original series development for Cartoon Network, and beyond. I also grew up in Hawaii, so there was a deep connection to the aina, the land, to the oceans, and the stars above. So we're so thrilled to show you a pitch, a new show inspired by our environments. And ever since we were kids, Nock and I loved watching cartoons and especially anime. But it's not just us who love anime. It's a huge business with a large audience all over the world. Uh, having worked in finance for many years, seeing this chart is very exciting for me. Uh, <laughs> the market size for anime will 2x in the next 10 years. And much like how uh, K-pop and K-drama have made waves in the world of music and live action, it's the same for anime. And it's making a big impact to viewers of all ages around the world. And over the years, Nock and I have found ways to really find uh, and highlight the best of both worlds from cartoons to anime. And with that, we would love for you to meet Zeno. He's 12 years old, short in height, short in temper. He also has green hair, and that's because he's zany, evil space prince from <laughs> outer space. Wow. And his uncle is an evil space king who ravages planets, sucking all of his resources, which messes up the planet, climate, and environment. He sucks. And <laughs> Zeno is next in line to take over the evil space kingdom. But Zeno, he just wants to be a kid and have fun. So he runs away to Earth that is far away from the reaches of the evil space king, for now. 
and on Earth, he meets his new besties, like Bobby, a softie who loves big bear hugs, and is an excellent cook, to Lou, sassy, but super smart inventor who is always tinkering on something crazy. And our fun trio will go on so many wild and epic adventures, from shrinking their classmates, to making giant animals out of raindrops, to shutting down heat rays, even facing off against evil space kids who love to cause huge messes and huge headaches to ecosystems across planets in the entire galaxy. So Yozina will have it all, action, comedy, drama, chaos, and we even have a big twist. Lou and Bobby are actually aliens who have made Earth their new home, same as Zeno. Uh, but Zeno also learns a very sad and serious truth of why his friends had to run away from their home planets, which is because his evil uncle, the evil space king, had conquered their planets and severely messed up its ecosystem, environment, and climate, making life there unbearable. So Zeno ran away to Earth because he wanted to just have fun. He was naive. But as he explores Earth, meeting new friends, he starts to learn the value of taking care of one's environment, the stewardship from the land itself that provides to the ocean, to the stars above. So Zeno experiences how everything is interconnected with one another and ends up finding a new home, which he never had before. And now he vows to protect it. Our story of Yo Zeno will touch on four key climate principles that are core to the Aspen Institute. Yo, Zero, Yo Zeno is a show where you get to experience how one's actions lead to greater impacts, experiencing many different perspectives and impacts of climate change. And same as you know, I'm also quite impatient, so we took action to create a very short animation test to bring Yozino to life. It's not the final visual style, but here it is. And boom! Thank you, thank you, thank you. So through Yozino, we hope to inspire and educate the next generation of climate leaders and teach them how to keep the Earth safe from evil space king and his goons one day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody first? <clears throat> well, I, I have some people to cast for evil space king, but we'll go there. <laughs> uh, talk about anime a little bit. Why is it so popular, and why do you think it, it hasn't really gone into these kinds of uh, subjects before? Sure, yeah, sure, oh, sure Gary, uh, great question. So from the earlier very exciting slide I showed you, how like, we saw how pop popular anime is. And the reason why I love anime, and the reason why I think it has so many fans around the world is that it gets silly and funny like cartoons, but it's also not scared to go deeper into more serious topics and themes, and all while sharing more uh, viewpoints across life, culture, and everything else in between. And if you find a really great anime, it's gonna make you laugh, it's gonna make you cry, it's also gonna make you feel powerful, inspired, and heard, which we know is what Yozino will do for kids everywhere, all while highlighting the very important issues of our climate today. So animation is notoriously expensive. Um, uh, tell us about your team and your technology. How will you be able to execute this project? Yeah, um, so we have dedicated our lives to animation. And for us, something about animation, it just feels so alive. Something about the handness of it. Um, so with some of the uh, productions with producers, the shorts that you have seen, the tests that we made, some of them might take months to even a year but with our expertise over a decade of experience and with a wonderful team of animators and designers, we're able to execute that in days. Really? So with that, we believe we have all the expertise and experience to execute it. So if the evil space king is the cause of problems, uh, how does that connect with the learning objective that we are the cause? Yeah, um, and oh my gosh. Um, Bill Nye, I can't believe I'm speaking to you. <laughs> well, I gotta be somewhere, I'm here. 
And you know, in a way, like uh, I watched your shows ever since I was little, and in a way, I learned. And look, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, in a way, I learned English through you. And oh. <laughs> to answer your. What question, was your first language? You were in Hawaii. Korean. Um, oh, oh, wow. Yeah, there original you know. Korea, raised in Hawaii, yeah. now here. <laughs> um, yeah. So from like evil uncle to the space cast. It's like very crazy, right? And imaginative. And I think one thing that we're trying to answer the question in Yozino is can you be scientific and imaginative? Because it's kind of crazy, right? And the answer we're finding is absolutely yes. And it starts with metaphors. And I think from the space of the heat ray guns that may tell the stories of drought to the global warming, to the droplets of creatures being formed from the waters. Um, these metaphors is in a way kind of like a gateway for the uh, younger audiences to understand the depth of storytelling and get closer to the science. So with that, we believe that imagination and science can come together through metaphors. Excellent. Please join me in thanking Young and Nak. Thank you so Thank you. much. And uh, now we have our last finalist pitch. Um, please join me in welcoming Erica Rabner and Robbie Ledoux to share their concept, Cold Sweat. Okay. Hey guys. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm Robbie, I've been in the industry, kids media industry for 25 years, and my MO is words and music. I'm Erica, I am a singer, songwriter, and kids media researcher. So opportunities like these where I get to marry my passions and my skill set are really why I got into this industry. So we are pitching you a song-driven blog style comedy series. It's a fish out of water story about Lila, a girl who's somewhat apathetic to climate change and to her dad, who is a climate scientist, takes her on a research expedition to the Great Barrier Reef where she accidentally goes viral. Our show is called Cold Sweat, and it's personal to us. Lila's home is Texas. I live in Texas as well, so I've seen a lot of this firsthand. From here on out, though, we're going to ask you to suspend your disbelief, and instead of describing our show, Erica is going to be our show, and I'll be the Greek chorus explaining it. Hey y'all, it's Lila from Texas coming to you at 5.30 a.m. I'm way jet lagged because it's still yesterday for me. I usually vlog from my ranch in Texas. Shout out to my horse Bella and friends at Barton Hills Middle School. Anyway, this week's gonna be a little different because I'm in Australia with my dad. Texas had another crazy freeze and closed school for the week, so here I am. But don't worry, I'll still share some new songs so it won't be that different. For anyone wondering, Lila's our protagonist. She's been posting YouTube videos for the last year trying to become an influencer, but nothing has hit. Now she's in Australia, and while she didn't feel connected to climate stuff before, she's starting to tune in to what's going on environmentally and connect it to what's been ha happening back home. The Great Barrier Reef isn't really what I thought it would be. I thought it'd be a lot bigger and brighter, but a lot of the coral looked white and dull. There's climate principle three in action. It's changing now, and it's impacting us. Throughout the course of our pilot, we'll address all four climate principles. This series will give us a chance to see that impact through Lila's eyes. And she's about to go viral with a song that Erica and I, I mean, Lila wrote. Back to you, Lila. It's a little scary, but it gave me an idea for a new song that I wanted to share. I woke up a world away and everything felt wrong. Dreamt the ocean disappeared, the beauty was all gone. Oh, I feel like a fish out of water, but it can't just be me. When I feel like a fish out of it's time to dive in deep Whoa, oh, 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 Let me know what you think in the comments. Should I finish it? So Lila posts 
that song and goes to bed. And when she wakes up, Whoa, I can't believe 1.8 million people watched my video. That's insane. I read a lot of comments about climate change in Australia, and it got me thinking about the fires, floods, and freezes back in Texas. It's all related, right? So that's our pitch, a spark of what we think is a viral YouTube-style comedy music series that speaks to where kids are. We realize most kids care about the environment, and Lila's a role model for those who are having trouble finding their voice, because boy, does she find hers. We know the most important thing you can do to fight climate change is talk about it. Or in our case, write songs and sing about it, like the one that you heard. As the granddaughter of four Holocaust survivors, I was raised to always think about the next generation. So it's really important to us, the kind of world that Lila and future generations will inherit. And in the next few months, it'll get a whole new sense of urgency for me. So we thank you all for this opportunity. We thank all of the participants. This has been amazing, and we would love to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So being a climate scientist who lives in Texas, who takes their child with them to show him how the world is changing, his TED Talk is called The Most Important Thing You Can Do Is Talk About Climate Change. I watched it. I feel like this was a slightly <laughs> customized pitch. <laughs> Um, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. And I love especially the fact that you picked Texas because you alluded to the fact that Texas is the most vulnerable state in the U.S. to climate impacts, mm -hmm. and she would have seen that in her own life. Tell me more about why you use Texas and how do you plan to build on that besides just having it as where she comes from? Yeah. Um, I was born in Texas, raised, um, I, last summer, I do not remember three straight months of over 100 degree weather, mm -hmm. no rain. Um, the frequency of the hurricanes down south, uh, that crazy ice storm that came through, including in Lubbock. Yep. Um, our show is built to be able to take our character, Lila, around the globe and hopefully show impacts all over the globe that affect people and kids where they live. Um, we plan or hope, if we're lucky enough to be chosen, uh, to go to places like Belize, South America, e even the glaciers. Okay. But um, yeah, and, it's, and it's, Texas. It's, it's been a rough ride in Texas. Yeah. 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 I will admit we were based in Texas before <laughs> we found out you were a judge, and we were yeah. thrilled by yeah. the connection. But I'm a researcher, so I had watched your TED talk and that you know talk about it, sing yeah. about it. That was that one was for you. <laughs> but the rest, we think Texas is just. We feel the differences. I also have spent a lot of time in Texas, mm -hmm. and I got caught in three freezes in the last three years, but a lot of these young kids, this is the norm, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So Texas is a really rich place to show these extremes that yeah. kids are facing. It's such a large state, you know, it's, it's, stuff happens in the north and in the south, and it's all different, and it's, it's, it's kind of weird right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So Lila's a fictional character, Yes. Is she, is she more than one voice, is she, or is she a single voice? Lila's a single voice. We really want to speak... Is that you? It won't be me. Uh -huh. uh, great question. <laughs> uh, we want to speak the tween language. So we've been, you know, working with bloggers and YouTubers, so we, casting would be of the utmost importance. And, we and so the, it'll go, it'll, there, there's a video element. Yes. And how long is each vlog? So, Cast. another great question, and to be honest, we're not 100% sure on that, but I have a research background. I'm also married to a YouTuber who is an expert in the creator economy. Um, we plan to test different lengths, mm -hmm. and I researched it, me for a while, so we plan to test different lengths and see what's resonating with kids. Um, whether it ends up being really short form, two minutes, or whether we could hold their attention for 15, 20 to yeah. be determined. Yeah, I, I certainly believe in music. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why is it? You know, it's <laughs> this crazy thing. Uh, but um, when I was younger, uh, one of my music teachers taught me about internalization, right? So like we all, when we hear a song that we love, it becomes part of our lives forever. Yeah. The Absolutely. thing that I'm curious about is that sometimes you don't really understand what the song is about. You have mm -hmm. your own interpretive, 
your own sense of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that your ecological concept and your sustainability concept will reach the listener? Yeah. Or, we, or will they just like the song? No, it's a great question. And it's very cool to be taking a question from yeah. you, Niall Rogers. Um, but we, like I said, we want to speak the language of tweens. So not only will we be sharing songs, but we will be showing and shedding light on some of the comments and some of the questions that are both asking lyrics. It's also tough to lyrically get across you know, the evolution and journey of a pilot episode where we have a seed. But our hope is that Lila's character will go through a wide range of emotions that we can explain through song. Because like you said, music is so powerful and has the power. And if I could add, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt Go for you. it. <laughs> um, being in the industry that we've been in for all these years, you know, we were kind of trained to speak the language and, and, and get these messages into songs, the, to, you know, how kids can understand them from, you know, preschoolers to tweens. So, um, yeah, it'll be very important working with the people from Aspen and, and they kind of guiding us to how do we say this? What do we say here? And then it's our job to take that and put it into a song and make it resonate with, with kids, right? Yeah. And even with adults and whoever I, listens yeah, to Yeah, I was right? just going to add, lyrics are so important yeah. here because message is so key. So we really yeah. want stickiness that resonates and can get at that evolution. So, so are you going to have science, scientific method, I mean to ask? Yes. Well, of yeah. course, Bill, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'm excited to write these songs, you know? Uh, this is going to... The show itself has a dual curriculum. We have the science curriculum yep. that will be guided by Aspen's, you know, four key principles, and we will use different episodes to shed light on some of these concepts, like coral bleaching, ocean acidification, loss of biodiversity, extreme weather. And then we have the emotional curriculum as well, where we see Lila's evolution from a somewhat apathetic, disconnected um, person to someone who grows to, at first, her eyes are open. She starts caring, and she becomes overwhelmed, which we can relate to as adults. Mm -hmm. And then she becomes hopeful and optimistic and even solution and action oriented. So we want to marry that science curriculum with that emotional curriculum to really speak to kids. Excellent. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That was just unbelievable. I hope um, you all feel the same way I do, which is just even more confident in our ability to actually help children understand that our world is changing, but together we can make a difference for a brighter future. Um, so please first join me in thanking our amazing judges who were here and their wonderful questions. Um, and then also please join me in thanking the finalists. They did such an amazing job and put forward such fantastic pitches. And now we hope that you all will stay tuned. We will work with our judges and we'll announce the winners uh, on Wednesday morning at the morning plenary. So thank you all and hope you all will head over to the evening plenary tonight.